Good afternoon. I'm Dennis Galucky and welcome to the 390th Imagine Buffalo program and another virtual lecture and discussion hosted by the downtown Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us today. This program has been created by the Center for the Study of Art and Architecture, History and Nature, or Cezanne as I call the acronym. And ImagineLifelongLearning.com. Both have been doing this program, creating it since December of 2009. We're going to start with our speaker shortly, but first, a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation, which will last about 15 to 20 minutes. We'll have time for questions at the end. If you have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it again later on the library's Facebook and the library's YouTube channel pages. As a reminder, we plan to be here on Zoom at the same link every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. with a great lineup of local speakers. Today is the second Tuesday of the month, so our theme focuses on architecture and design. Our featured speaker is Tina Maria Kumega, who was scheduled to give this presentation at last summer's 11th annual Buffalo Day at Chautauqua during week six. The Chautauqua theme for that week was art and democracy. Today, we get to hear and see that presentation. Tina Marie has been a master docent with Explore Buffalo since 2014. She is a self-described history nerd with a love of antiques and old buildings. Tina Marie has researched and written several of Explore Buffalo's tours and is currently on the training committee for Explore Buffalo. Now her training emphasis is on the virtual classroom with her third grade grandson. And now let's welcome Tina Marie Kumega, who is going to talk about art and democracy, the Acropolis and Buffalo's History Museum and Albright Knox Art Gallery. Tina? Thank you, Dennis. And thank you for letting me do this presentation for you. Art and democracy. I think we just recently saw democracy at work with our um, elections. And it's a new concept. There's still many countries in our world that are not democracy. So it's something that we really should be proud of. Pictures here. Okay. Art and democracy. Architectural inspiration for Buffalo's buildings came from Athens. And what was Athens in Greece? It was a democracy. Okay. Athens is actually the birthplace of democracy. And at the birth of the United States, many people in this young republic um, prophesied that the United States was going to be the next Athens with the American freedom sparking a new golden age of culture. And then in the 1820s, many saw parallels between our Revolutionary War and the Greek revolt at the time, which was against the Ottoman Empire. They wanted to be a democracy again. And the result was a Greek revival Let's revive the old Greek times. Let's revive that democracy. And this initiated Athens in terms of the clothing, the jewelry, the furniture style, interior design, and especially that temple front architecture. Before I change the page here, I want you to all close your eyes and imagine a Greek temple. I know we can all do it because it is a very, very unique looking design. And there it is. Now, these are all pictures from Chautauqua because, as Dennis mentioned, this was designed to be given at Chautauqua. So we're going to have some Chautauqua pictures in there alongside pictures from Greek temple design in Buffalo. So this, this Greek um, revolt against the Ottoman Empire sparked a Greek revival, and it kind of paralleled what we were going through. We were a, a new republic. We were a new democracy. So all around the world, and especially here, Designers jumped on that Greek style. 
I want to talk today about Greek architecture, the influence of Greek architecture on the buildings in Buffalo. So as you're looking here, I hope most of you, I'm sure all of you, and I see Cheryl on here, I know she did, pictured the top left corner here. You, that's the Greek temple. You have that portico or that porch with the columns, that triangular pediment at the top with the, the tympanum is the area inside that triangle that's always decorative. That is your Greek temple style. And not only do we have it at Chautauqua, as you can see here, but we have it all over Buffalo. Not only in um, buildings that belong to government and to, to commercial, but also to homes. And we'll talk a little about that too. So top of the build, top of the screen, bottom of the screen. On top, you have the Acropolis, which is right in Athens. This is the ruins, the Erechtheum and the Parthenon. I mean, the original Greek temple style, right? So down below what you have, what we have in Buffalo. You have the Albright Art Gallery, and I'm not going to even try to pronounce the new name of it. The Albright Knox, the AK, we'll call it the AK, and the Buffalo History Museum. Now, the History Museum, for those who don't know, was the only permanent structure built as part of the Pan American Exposition in 1901. All the other buildings were a uh, temporary structures, plaster of Paris type thing on, on frames and all taken down. But this was a solid marble building built as the New York State building and then given to Buffalo and the History Museum. But you can see Greek temple from 400 BC to Greek temple style in the 1800s. And who was responsible for bringing well, two of the people that were responsible for bringing this style to Western New York, the architects Green and Wicks. Mr. Green is the gentleman with the glasses, Mr. Wicks, the other side. So Edward Green and um, Sidney Wicks came to the Buffalo area in the 1880s from Auburn, New York. Why did they come to Buffalo? Well, Buffalo was a booming place. We went from a small village of about two or 3,000 people to the turn of the century, 1900, at 300,000 people. It's bigger than the city is now population wise in a smaller geographic area. So it was a place to be. If you're gonna be an architect, you're gonna come here and make money. So they were responsible for the AK, the Albright Knox, and also some of the buildings at Chautauqua. If you take any of the Explore Buffalo tour, or tours, you'll hear green and wicks, green and wicks over and over again. They did hundreds of buildings in Buffalo, not only government buildings, but commercial buildings and homes. Mr. Green lived to the age of 95, and he was still a working architect in 1950. So let's start comparing old Greece, the original democracy to Buffalo's buildings. The Erechtheum, 400 BC, the architect was Nisicles, Nisicles. Um, the Albright Knox, 1901 to 1905, architects were Green and Wicks. Original, it looks like the same building, just like a newer version of it. It's ionic in style, and that's the, talking about the columns. Look at the eyes on the top of the columns. I use word association to help me remember a lot of things. When I think of ionic, I think of eyes, and we'll go into those eyes in a little more detail. And this is a hexastyle portico. Portico is nothing other than a fancy name for a porch. Hexastyle, because count the columns. There's six columns on each. Let's get a closer look. Top of the page, 400 BC. Bottom of the page, 1901. Their designs are identical. As we go through these, you're going to see that it just looks like something, a newer version of the old one. What you have here is the Egan Dart molding, which is very, very prolific in all of this Greek architecture. All of the Beaux-Arts architecture, which is fine arts coming from Greek and Roman times, highly influenced by the Egan Dart design. And you'll, you'll see it from now on, you go, oh, I know what that is, that's Egan Dart, because it has an egg with a dart in between it. Now the columns, we talk about the Ionic capitals. There's three basic types of capitals, which is the top, the crown of the column, this is the ionic, and like I said, word association is how I remember things, because they look like eyes to me. Whenever you have those, those circular volutes at the top, it's ionic. 
The other two styles is Doric, and we will see Doric later, and then Corinthian, which we will not see on this presentation. But look at the design, it almost, it's identical. You have the flutes, you have the ionic capitals, you have the egg and dart, egg and dart, same thing here, egg and dart, and the athemia design in here. Okay, let's compare a little bit more. We've already talked about the egg and dart, exactly the same at the top. Uh, the volutes, that's a technical term for what I call the eye on the ionic capital. The Athenia, it's that flower design here, it here. At the top of the Genesee building, which is the Hyatt Hotel, there's a whole row of Athenia done in copper. Okay. The fluted shaft, a fluted shaft is Greek. Again, a word association. For me, if it's Greek, it's grooved. The other type of column that you will see would be a smooth column, and that would be a Tuscan. But if you see those grooves, you know it's a Greek column. The end cone supporting the cornice. A cornice is always done at a roof line. It can be done at a ceiling and it can be done above a doorway or a window. What it is, it's a projection coming off of a door, a window, or usually it's the roof line. Now this is considered an end cone because it's, it's a double volute. They're also called medillions and those are usually more of a block design. Uh, they're called corbels and sometimes they're just called brackets, but this is an end cone design. And look at these two entrances, they're identical. You've got the egg and dart, you've got the anthemias, the design here, and they even have the, the, the leaf, I mean, identical. The architect that did this and probably Green and Wicks, so we're talking about their buildings, looked at pictures and reproduced them almost exactly. Now, someone once asked me about the little dots across the little, little plastic projections across the top. When I do the tour on Main Street, we go into the Market Arcade, there's great big ones. And we kind of chuckle about it because that's only there to keep the pigeons off. Okay, another thing we're going to compare between the two is dental molding. We talked about egg and dart, and most of these designs um, describe themselves. When you think of dental molding and you see these square bricks, do you think of teeth? Well, that's what dental refers to. They're square rows of teeth. Okay. Again, the Erechtheum and the Albright Art Gallery. Rosettes is another design that we've gotten from the Greeks. Here you see it along the, the frieze, which is being held up by the columns. Uh, a good place to see some beautiful rosettes is again, if you're walking into the Market Arcade on Main Street, which is on several of our tours, they have an arched um, roof line as you're walking in, a ceiling area, and it's coffered. Coffered just means it's done in little squares. You'll find that a lot of times in dining room or living rooms of these older homes. And in each one of those coffered squares is a beautiful rosette. Now here's a close-up of a chunk of molding from the Albright Knox and the Erechtheum. You see the egg and dart, which we talked about, and the darts are very uh, specific on the Albright Knox because it's only 100 years old, where the darts are a little more muted on the 2,000-year-old building. And below that is a called a reed, bead and reel molding. Again, it describes it what it looks like. So these terms are not difficult. They basically describe what you're looking at. So let's look at it from a distance. It looks like it could be the same building. And here we want to, to um, highlight the Caryatid portico, which is just the Caryatid porch. And the reason they're called Caryatid is because I want you to look at the columns here. One, two, three, four, five, and look at the columns here, the four on either side, so you can see those. And they're not columns, they're statues. And that's what a Caryatid is, it's a statue. Here's the close up. Greek goddesses, Green and Wick's version of the Greek goddess. And here the um, sculptor was Augustus Saint Godin. Here's close up on him. The flowing robes, the crown at the top. And if you notice, we can go back one. 
the style is all the same. There may be a little bit of a difference on the sway of the clothing, but the style is all the same. And again, down here at the Albright Knox, the style is all the same, the hair and the clothing. From a distance again, we saw this picture before comparing the buildings. Now this is a museum and this is a museum, but we also have homes in Buffalo. If you do the mansions tour on Delaware Avenue, there's a house that is the very front of it has got these big portico. It's got the tympanum at the top and it's got the columns. And that's the Foreman mansion. So we do have a mansion that we drive by every day and walk by on our tours that is Greek column style. So who was responsible for building these buildings? Well, the New York State Pavilion, which became the History Museum, the architect was Mr. Carey, and that's a picture over here on the left. He married into the Burge family. The Burge, the wallpaper people, have a mansion at Symphony Circle across from Kleinhand, and this is their monument at Forest Lawn Cemetery, and it is done in the Greek column style. If you look at the top of the columns, here's going to be your first view of what would be considered a door column. It's a very plain crown or very plain capital to the top of the column. Again, the Parthenon and the New York State Pavilion, which is the History Museum. What were they constructed out of? We mentioned that the all the buildings, except for this building at the 1901 Pan American Exposition were all done of a plaster of Paris type um, semi-permanent material. This was not. This was a permanent building, the only one built, and it is Vermont marble. And so were all the buildings in Greece. They were also all marble. The architect was George Carey. The sculptor who did all the carving was Charles Niehaus. And then the architect was Ictius, Callicrates, and the sculptor here was Phidias. They couldn't get him to come over and work on this. He had been dead for a few years by the time they built this one. Now, I mentioned the Doric style column. That's what you have here on the top. The tops are very plain. They're not decorative. There's no volutes. There's no eyes for the iconic. And this is an octa style colonnade. Why? Just for the numbers. Instead of six, you have three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight just describes the number of columns across the front of the portico. Now let's look at the top of, we talked about the columns and we talked about moldings, um, egg and dart, bead and reel, dental. Let's talk about that distinctive feature which is on these Greek columns and that is that triangular top, the pediment with the tympanum inside it. And we have, of course, a beautiful one to look at here. The one at the Parthenon is missing, but we do have a picture that's been reproduced. There's a, the pediment plaster reproduction what would have been inside the pediment that was on the top of it. And what we have below is the, inside the pediment on that New York State Pavilion or History Museum. Very, very similar in design. This one we refer to more of a bas-relief marble sculpture and you see a much more bas-relief design in um, Art Deco. And it just means that it's not completely three-dimensional all the way around, where these figures on top of the Parthenon, they are three-dimensional, front, side, and back. The bas-relief is gonna have front and side, but the back will be flat, it'll be attached to the wall. But very, very similar in design, that Greek Roman goddess looking sort of thing, same thing here. down to the very corners where you have someone reclining underneath, you have people reclining underneath. So similar that it's, it's almost like a picture, a new version, old version. Other features of the Greek design, triglyphs, which are just drops. And we're talking about the little mini columns that drop off the roof here in the newer building and in the Parthenon and the new tools. And those are just the blocks, the, the rectangular blocks with the dots in them. And they're usually underneath a cornice. 
and uh, identical again from the Parthenon to the History Museum. Now all these pictures and all these designs have come off of Chuck Lachusa's website, which is um, buffaloah.com. I would love you to go there and take a look at it, but only do it if you have several hours because you will literally get lost going from one picture to the other picture, one building to the other picture. It really pulls you in and it's very hard to leave that website. But if you're into history, if you're into architecture, that's the place to go. The Parthenon, the New York State Pavilion. So what did the Greeks carve? What were their people? We talked about Greek goddesses. Their gods, the people that, that were important in their history and their lifestyle. But down below in the New York State Pavilion, we have a very unusual picture carved in there and it's the Underground Railroad panel. So next time you're at the History Museum, I uh, challenge you to, to find that on the outside of the building. And then we'll talk a little bit about the Doric column. The Doric is the, the plainest of the columns. Um, we're not talking about the, the third style capital top, which would be the Corinthian, and that is extremely um, decorative. Lots of volutes and flowers and um, just all sorts of little designs on it. This is the plainest. And at the very top, there's a square block. And it actually has a name. It's called an abacus. Uh, when you see abacus, you think about the, the counting thing that the Greeks and the... Um, actually before the Greeks even used them, that they used to count with, with the little beads on the um, wires. Well, abacus, the word originally comes back from, um, oh, way before the Greeks, back in um, the Middle Eastern and probably even in Jesus's time, Semitic, I think the language was. And all it meant was, was square block to begin with. So this is what you have above these, do these Doric columns. And again, the Parthenon, the New York State Pavilion, which is they use the name interchangeably. We know it as the History Museum, museum identical. Look at that, just identical. I just, I, I'm in awe of how identical this was to the Greeks' buildings. Okay. And that's the end of the presentation of the PowerPoint. Again, Buffalo Architecture and History website is buffaloah.com. I invite you to go and look at the rest of the buildings. Just research the Greek architecture and you'll see many more buildings. And of course, I have to um, ask you to come in back to explore Buffalo this spring. We're doing very few tours in the winter, but as soon as we're able to, we will start doing the walking tours again. And you can see all these beautiful buildings in person. Okay. Dina, that's uh, just a wonderful presentation. And I'm so glad you put this together. This. Uh, as I mentioned, inspired the idea of arts and democracy as uh, uh, to hold Buffalo Day. Uh, and finally, we get to, uh, to see the, the rationale behind that. Uh, what, uh, Leah, do we have any questions for our speaker? We don't have any questions. Okay, great. Then we're going to chat for a minute or two. Okay. Um, uh, part of, uh, that I want you, to carry on the thought, uh, part of I know what Chuck Lacusa was hoping to accomplish with his incredible website, and again, the A stands for architecture and the H stands for history, buffaloah.com. Uh, once you're there, uh, you, you, you need more than a couple of hours, Tina. You need a couple of months probably. But uh, the reality is Chuck was... Uh, trying to help us as an educator, as a retired uh, educator from City Honors, he was trying to help us, uh, uh, the folks in Buffalo, to better see our own community, uh, to better understand what we were looking at. Uh, think of all the people riding down the expressway, going by both of those buildings, uh, and, and uh, just it's kind of part of the, the fabric of life, uh, to stop, uh, get out of the car, Take a look, and Tina, you've helped us do that. Uh, is that how you got involved with uh, Explore Buffalo? Uh, well, like I had said, I'm I'm self-proclaimed history nerd, and I love architecture, and I love the old buildings. That those are my favorite to talk about, and it just 
when I saw them advertising quite a few years ago to train new docents because Chuck's website actually morphed into Explore Buffalo. He and Brad Hahn started Explore Buffalo the year or so before I joined them. And, um, and they were looking for people to be docents. And I, I just tell this funny story that my husband looked at me one day and I, I read this in the paper and I told him, I think I'd like to try this. He said, oh, please, please go talk to somebody else. You know, after four years, go talk to somebody else. And, you know, I had to keep watching the clock because I, I can talk much longer than I did. But I, I kept it within my time frame. But I love to show this to people. I get excited about Buffalo's buildings and architecture. I just do it. it just it excites me. We'll we'll travel around the country and I'll go. Oh, stop! Look. Oh, that's Greek column style. You know, that's Beaux Arts style. Look at that the pediment on that building. And my husband will just roll his eyes. And uh, it just it's something that I love to 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 show to people to show them how wonderful our city is. Look at what we have here. And many of the people who take our tours will say, you know, I drive by these buildings all the time, or I walk through downtown all the time. I never stop and look. And that's what we're giving you the opportunity to do. Come on our tours and stop and look. We have one um, docent who uses the term, let your eyes dance around the building and be amazed by what you see. That's, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, the there were ancient values and, and uh, uh, subtitle I've developed, uh, the ancient aesthetic values, beauty, truth, uh, goodness, justice. Uh, and it, it's, it's almost as if the folks a hundred years ago, uh, both at Chautauqua, and I'm glad you showed the comparisons with the uh, E.B. Green architecture in Chautauqua uh, and Buffalo, uh, it, it's part of what connects those two spaces for me and, um, and part of the rationale for exploring the Buffalo Chautauqua idea. A hundred plus years ago, there was this attempt to, uh, to help us see these deeper values. What is beauty? Uh, uh, what is truth? Uh, uh, and, and give it expression in architecture. That's my take of what was going on uh, uh, 2,000 plus years ago in the, in, uh, the time of the Greeks uh, empire and also 100 years ago uh, when we were building buildings like this around the very democratic Olmstead parks, uh, which were designed for everybody, not just the wealthy. Uh, and and uh, as people know, uh, I trust the first uh, Olmstead park system um, initiated here in 1868, uh, and then these buildings complement it. So you've really helped us see, I think, uh, uh, better what, uh, again, is there to be seen by those who have eyes to see and take the time to do so. <laughs> well, one of Olmsted's vision was something that you had mentioned, that everyone should have the ability to go out and enjoy nature. You know, they didn't have cars, they didn't have way to transport themselves out into the country, out to East Aurora, out to Hamburg. If you lived in the city and you worked, you, you stayed in the city. But his parkway system was designed so that within a few blocks, you could experience grass and trees. So the working man could go out and enjoy nature. Well, I'm, uh, I'm just proud of uh, Chuck and how he inspired people like yourself and continues to inspire with that website not just in Buffalo. Uh, I've met people in Chautauqua from the West Coast that looked at his website and designed their houses based on what they saw. Uh, beautiful uh, houses that are uh, uh, new builds down in Chautauqua from time to time. So uh, yeah, I think it's got a global reach. Um, I, I uh, Explore Buffalo has just been a phenomenal success uh, as a not-for-profit that has trained so many good people like yourself, volunteers. It's why I created this uh, Center for the Study of Art, Architecture, History, and Nature. It's a digital enterprise and network designed to help link volunteers and lifelong learning communities. Uh, every not-for-profit suddenly helps lifelong learning, whether it's the Martin House or the, the Birchfield or the Albright Knox and certainly explore Buffalo. That's my take of it anyways, with 
Does that make sense to you? It does make sense. And every year we train more and more Buffalonians and people from Western New York. We even have a few Canadians. They can't come over right now, but we do have a few of our docents who are Canadians and they come over because they love Buffalo. Buffalo is like, their, it is, we are their sister city. And we will be doing another training this spring. It's going to be online through Zoom. But if anyone is interested and would like to take of our, our training, just watch the website. It will be advertised. Tina, that's great. Our time is up. So we're going to uh, uh, close out. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we, Welcome for having me here. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. We so appreciate this new format, which allows us to archive the Imagine program on the library's Facebook and YouTube channel pages. Uh, so check those out for previous uh, programs. Please join us uh, next Tuesday, same time, same Zoom link. Uh, when our speaker is Reverend Joan Montagnes and the Minister for the Unitarian Universal Church, I'm going to connect the transcendentalists of another era with today. Uh, I trust in that presentation. I'm Dennis Galecki. Be well and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye.